Everything should be ready. We're good? Good morning, church, and welcome to Bethel Thedford. I'm Pastor Linda, and I pray that you'll be blessed by God's word today. We're going to start off singing, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Then we're going to be having communion, so um, you folks at home, get your communion elements together, and we'll celebrate the Lord's supper together. I have to get the right page up. You should always turn the pages back to where you're supposed to start, right? <laughs> that always helps. Uh. It does. <laughs> My goodness. Okay, I'll do the first line. <laughs> place. Fill our hearts, fill this sanctuary with your presence, Lord. Let your will be done in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, as we uh, do the first Sunday of each month, we celebrate what's called the Lord's Supper or Communion or Eucharist or there's so many different names, my goodness. I wouldn't be able to remember them all. I'd have to write them all down and then read them. As we faithfully wait on the Lord's return, we will continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper, or as we call it here, communion. Every time we take communion, the gospel is proclaimed and we believe it and embrace it once again. In other words, we remember. 1 Corinthians 11. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as as often as you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Thank you, Jesus. And as we've been doing lately, We're going to uh, recite the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13, and this is the King James Version that we use. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing a few more songs. Um, when we say the Lord's Prayer, it's, um, King James has uh, debts and debtors. That means what we owe. What we owe. Um, actually, I don't know what version has trespasses. 
those who trespass against us. I think that's in the. I'm not sure. I was taught that when I was at. I know. I know. I think that's in the <laughs> Catholic version of the Bible. <laughs> that still re refers to the same thing. It's for what's been done wrong. Right. But I know it confuses a lot when we uh, we say debts and debtors. That, it was hard for me to get used to that too. But anyway, you get used to it. We're going to sing a few more songs, and then we're going to go through the um, restricted access nations. We'll start off with what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs>
one more. <laughs> Getting the wrong notes. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I'll get there. I'll get there. The trouble is, the ones I'm messing up are the ones that I was doing okay on when we were practicing. He's got everything in his hands. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, each week we've been going through uh, the restricted access nations. We're on week number four. The fourth most dangerous um, nation for Christians to be living in is Libya. And that's, um, I can't read it from here. What does that say under there? Sharing the gospel could have you arrested and detained. That's right. That's right. Okay. And then we go to the next one. And that's the, uh, the profile that's given there. Now, the one thing we need to remember, with uh, the uh, restricted access uh, nations, that means that uh, it could be deadly for uh, believers in those countries, and in most cases it is. But that doesn't stop the move of God. Their faith is strong. And they uh, lean on Luke 2.10, which I think was back a few uh, slides, and it says, uh, these are his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. So the... Um, you're, you're moving ahead too far. Sorry. That's okay. That, that one was on the very first one for uh, RAN. If you wanted to go back to that one. One more. There it is. Luke 2. Okay. So they have to be strong. They have to be strong. Now, uh, if you want to move it ahead to profile. That's profile. And you'll find all this information in those books that are back there at the back. 
the uh, 2022 World Watch List. And this is in effect until uh, the end of 2023. So Libya is in the country of Africa. It's is Islamic oppression is the persecution, but it's also uh, what they call clan oppression or family, extended family. And the population of that country is 6,746,000. The number of Christians is 34,600. The main religion is Islam. The leader is Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Baida, Baiba. <clears throat> okay, if you want to go through to the, um, the one on oppression, there we go. Uh, what I have here is just a little bit different than what it is there. It says, when a person in Libya leaves Islam to follow Christ, they face immense pressure from their families to renounce their faith. Their neighbors and the rest of the community ostracize them, and they can be left homeless, jobless, and alone. If a Libyan Christian shares his or her faith with someone else, they will likely be reported, arrested, and perhaps face violent punishment. Like I said, and that could include death. The country has no central government, so laws are not enforced uniformly, leaving Christians in danger of overt and public persecution. So what may be against the law today may not be against the law tomorrow. It depends on what's going on at the time and if they had a bad egg or not. Targeted kidnappings and executions are also a possibility for believers. To be a safe Christian in Libya is to live a secret life of faith. But that doesn't stop God's word from spreading. Okay, if you want to move it to the next one. The most vulnerable. Christians are vulnerable throughout Libya, whether they live in the country or are passing through for migrant work or trying to reach Europe to start a new life. In some cases, Christians are apprehended and delivered to criminal officials or human trafficking groups where they are forced into heavy labor or are pushed into prostitution. Believers who share their faith with someone else will likely be reported, arrested, and perhaps face violent punishment. Now this is a comment that's made from a believer there. And he says, nothing can compare to the life that Jesus gave me. Family, home, and my business. He's lost all of those. But that doesn't compare to the joy that he has from having Jesus. That's how important um, Christ is. All right. 2 Corinthians 4, 9, and 10 is the description of Christians in the Rand nations, random access nations. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Okay, the next one. Those are the points to pray for Libya. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we pray that the powers in control of the country of Libya have an encounter with Jesus and recognize him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings and direct the country to worship God Almighty through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the meantime, we ask that the believers in that country are able to have safe times of fellowship with the Lord and are encouraged and strengthened in our prayers. We ask, Lord, that stability is brought into the government and peace will reign. We also pray for wisdom and protection for those who support persecuted believers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The ones that are helping them are also at risk, whether they're in the country itself or not. Okay, do we want to move it on? There we go. That symbol there, it represents faith, love, and hope. You can see where faith is written. You can also see the cross is there, and the heart, of course, is uh, love. Okay, our message today is on love, the love of God. Romans 5, verses 6 to 7, this is going to be on three different uh, slides, so it uh, goes right through to 11. When we are utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. 
But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. That's the reason that love came down from heaven, down to the earth. So how much do you love God? Have you ever, ever really thought about it? Sounds like a dumb question, I know, because people think, people that have accepted Jesus say, well, yeah, I love God. That's why I accepted Jesus as my Savior. But how much? How much? We're gathered today with the purpose of worshiping God and with the purpose of praising God. Why? Because he loves us. And he loved us before we even knew him. So the least we can do is uh, respond with praise and worship. 1 John 4.10 this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. God created us to love him. He also gave us the ability to make the choice of whether or not we want to love him. It's a choice. He loved us first. And God wants us to spend eternity with him. And again, that's a choice. And we're the only ones that can make it. Either eternity with God in heaven or eternity in hell. Not much of a choice as far as I'm concerned. The way has been pre prepared for us. And it tells us that in Philippians 1.6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he has begun a good work in you. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's at work in our lives, individually, individually. We all go at our own pace. And some of us, uh, we grab hold of it at a very young age. Some it's toddlers. And others, it's as we get older, as we get older. So he is at work in our lives. And it's our responsibility to respond to him, to be obedient to him. It's our responsibility to be in communication with him. Constant communication. You remember that one verse? 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Paul had written that. Remember, Paul wasn't always Paul. He used to be Saul. And he used to persecute the believers, the ones who believed in the way. It was called the way then. And it, we're called Christians now. But uh, believers had gone uh, throughout. <clears throat> Praying is communicating with God Almighty. We're to be aware that God is in control. Sometimes it looks like things are falling apart, but God is still in control. We have to call out to God, and that's where we get the peace, and that's where we get the joy in our heart. doesn't mean we're happy. Happy has nothing to do with joy. Joy is how our heart condition is. Happiness is what's going on around us. You get, um, you get to get the Mustang out of the garage, and buff it up on a sunny day and go for a nice ride and that makes you happy. That's happiness. That doesn't give you joy, but it gives you happiness. Or if uh, Boston wins, I think they won last night, that makes you happy, if it's your team. If it's not your team, it doesn't make you so happy. So I mean, it's, um, that's, that's something that's outside of the, uh, the spirit realm. Matthew 19:26. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. God can give us joy in the worst of the situation. You look at the people in Libya. Look, well, something a little uh, more in the news. In the Ukraine, if you watch some of the uh, news clips, they're gathering together all the time, praising God, and they have joy in their heart, and yet bombs are falling, but they have joy in their heart. Now, this is the time of year when people will ask, are you ready for Christmas? You got all the presents bought? Are you ready for Christmas? Most will say no. 
I can say no quite easily. We haven't been out uh, too much to get stuff. Uh, we just, uh, basically we get it for the great grandkids now. You know, you go down through the, <laughs> that's the little ones we get for. But what about the spiritual side of it, the spiritual question? Are you ready for Christ? That's a tough one. You haven't been popping those ones up. That's why you've got a list. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, are you ready for Christ? That's the next one. There we go. People waited hundreds of years for the Messiah to come to Christ, or to meet their Christ. And then it came as a wee babe, and that's not what they expected. They expected the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come in on a, I don't know what on, probably on a horse or something, but have uh, all of the battle army ready and ready to save them physically that way from the oppressor, because at that time, the Romans were in control of their country. There was usually somebody in control, but the last ones when Christ had come was the Romans. <coughs> and he wasn't born in a palace or a castle or anything to that effect. He was born in a barn. Have you ever said that to your kids? What's the matter with you? Are you born in a barn? Yep. And what does that mean? You left the door open. And I used to hear that all the time, and you're, you're coming in the house in a hurry, and you're thinking the door is going to shut behind you, but they're not like they were now. They didn't always shut. You had to hang on to it to bring it in to close it. I wasn't born in a barn either. <laughs> you were born in, I wasn't. I was born in my grandmother's house. You were born at home too. See, way, way back then, you didn't go to the hospital to be born. You do that. And, well, now they're going back to that. They're having more home births now too. Jesus' bed wasn't a nice little uh, crib with cushions on it. And think, well, cushions aren't a good idea anyway, but it wasn't in uh, a sanitary, what we consider to be sanitary uh, situation. Where was his bed? Angel. In the manger. What's a manger? Where the cattle eat up. Yeah, it's a feeding trough. That's right. That's right. And that could be quite pertinent, couldn't it? He tells us, yes, drink the living water. Do you want the living water? Not, not um, something that you think about all the time. Okay, Jesus' first visitors were shepherds. Now, they were considered to be the lowest of the low of uh, people. He was God incarnate. You hear the expression, Jesus is the reason for the season? You see those signs all over the place? It could also be rephrased that we are the reason for him coming, which means we're the reason for the season. If it wasn't for sin in the world, there wouldn't have been a need for Jesus to come to redeem mankind to have a right relationship with God because before sin, they had a relationship with God. They walked with God in the garden. That was Adam and Eve. Without sin, God would not have had to come down to earth in the form of a human baby, giving up all of his holiness, all rights to deity for the sole purpose of being a sacrificial lamb for all mankind. And the reason? Because of love, because of love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, this time of year can bring its frustrations and undue stress because we get our focus off the Lord and onto what the world is looking at. And what's the world looking at right now at this time of year? Shop, shop, shop. Yeah. You've got to have this. All the advertisements come on, and the kids start thinking, oh, I need that, I need that, I want that. It's cool. <laughs> I know, it's, it's cool, yeah. But it's more want than need. God provides what we need. He provides what we need. Not always what we want, but sometimes what we want. But he'll provide what we need. Life in general can give us stress without the impact of the commercialism of Christmas. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, especially through this time. Colossians 3, 15. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace 
and always be thankful. <coughs> this shows that our circumstances don't have to be perfect to experience the peace that he brings. We may not even understand how we can have the peace and the calmness when things are at their worst, but we can know that God's love will always see us through. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, this is one that we should, uh, should remember. We used to sing it all the time when we had uh, kids club. Don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done, not just for little bits and pieces, for all that he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Remember all the actions? God is at work in your life, no matter what things look like today. Let the peace of God rule in your life. Let his peace crowd out the aggravation, the stresses, the worries, the conflicts that can be difficult enough throughout the rest of the year. But they seem to be magnified at Christmas time. Everything seems to be magnified at this time of the year. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Take on his peace. Again, the choice is yours. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The biblical account of Jesus is a historical fact. It's the truth. The gospel account of what Jesus did is also a historical fact. The apostles lived during that time and they experienced it all. And they shared it. The more people try to disprove the accounts, the more they prove the validity of the historical facts. Things don't always happen as we expect them to, especially when God breaks into our lives to shake us up, and he has a habit of doing that. God heard the pleas of his people, and in his response was an expression of grace and truth, and that came in a manger, in a stable. The light shone in the city of David that night, and it started a chain of events that led to the cross 33 years later. The Messiah came as promised that day, many years after it was prophesied. 33 years later, through the blood of Jesus, grace and redemption came on the cross. Jesus said that he would come again at the appointed time. And that's what we wait for. In the Gospels, Jesus promises his return, but he doesn't say when. The promise is intended to give people hope, but Jesus makes it clear that it should do more than that. It should cause us to live in such a way that it constantly, our lives will constantly reflect our readiness to meet our Lord and Savior. Matthew 24, 36 and it's also recorded in Mark 13, 32. No one knows when that day or time will be. Not the angels in heaven, not even the Son. Only the Father knows. While we're, we wait, we are to continue to live according to the way the Lord says we're to live. We're to be ready, and we're to stay ready, so that we don't have to get ready. Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians and at the same time was writing it to us. 2 Corinthians 3, the first slide is uh, verse 3. I know I've got 3 and 4 on there. You are a letter from Christ delivered by us. That means each individual is a letter from Christ and is delivered by the uh, apostles. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets not of tablets of stone, but on the tablets of our hearts, living hearts. Verses 4 to 6, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over our hearts. 
When Christ's word is given, that veil is gone. We have clarity. 2 Corinthians 3.16 But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So let's celebrate Jesus by having a God-planned Christmas, one in which we open our hearts to his great love and give him permission to transform us, to change us from what we now are to what he wants us to be. Praise God. We're going to sing a couple of more songs, and then we'll close in prayer. I'll do the first one. Maybe the only thing I play. <laughs>
while shepherds watch their flocks by night. <laughs> for being with us today and I pray Lord that your word was a blessing to us and our songs of praise were a blessing to you. I pray Lord that you be with each and every one of us throughout the balance of this day and the balance of this week. Let our hearts be focused on you at all times Lord. Lord we lift up our missionaries that put their lives in your hands every day, every moment of the day as they go around the world proclaiming your word to save lives Lord to save their spiritual lives. Many times the physical lives are lost, but their spiritual lives are eternally alive. We pray, Lord, that you just bless those folk. Keep them strong, keep them courageous. 
Some of them we uh, support, and we pray that you be with them at all times because it's, it's been so difficult, especially the ones that have moved from Russia, and they're uh, trying to make the way to Israel. Some of them have made it there and some haven't, but they're waiting for paperwork. We pray that you open the way so paperwork can be brought in. But it's not just the ones that we support, Lord. They're all over the world, and they need your touch. They need your protection. But we also need that, Lord, because we're on a mission field where we are. We don't have to go around the world because we have people all around us that need to hear your name. They need to know that you love them, especially at this time of year. And the ones who have suffered loss at this time of year, it's so difficult for them. We pray, Lord, that your joy will be sufficient for them, that your love will be sufficient for them. Help them all, Lord. Help us. Use us as your instruments. Open our eyes so we can see the need. Open our mouths, Lord, so we can speak your words. Be with us all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And as we do each week, we're going to finish off with God be with you. Okay, so I'll do the first line. <laughs> Okay.